Hello and welcome dear students. Today we are going to discuss about decline of Mauryan Empire. The first dominion over all of India was the Mauryan Empire. Ashoka, Bindusara and Chandragupta Maurya were successful in establishing the Maurya's imperial rule over a significant number of Janapadas or kingdoms in developing a novel approach to extensive government. However, with Ashoka's demise, that is in 232 BC, the Maurya's imperial power started to decline and finally fell apart in 180 BC. Before we talk about the decline in debate, let me first talk about the main objectives. To know about the causes responsible for the decline of Mauryan Empire, to what extent Ashoka's successors are blamed for the collapse of the empire, how other political and economic forces are regarded to be driving the empire to collapse and finally, what extent the actions of Ashoka's policy contributed to the fall of the empire. The Mauryas were successful in establishing a first pan-Indian empire. However, this empire was subject to fall sometime around 180 BC. A single reason cannot adequately explain the complex question of what led to the collapse of the Mauryan Empire. Combinations of causes led to the collapse of the Mauryan Empire. In this section, we will first talk about how Ashoka's successors contributed to the collapse of the empire. Then, we shall focus on Ashoka's policies, the economic issues of the Mauryan state, etc. The growth of small polities has also been taken into account while understanding why the Mauryan Empire fell apart. So first we will be talking about Ashoka's successors. It is widely assumed that Ashoka died in 232 BC, but after his death, the Mauryan emperors continued to govern for another 50 years. According to the Puranas, the Mauryan kingdom fell around 187 BC when Brahadatta, the dynasty's last emperor, was deposed and killed by Pushmitra Sunga, the founder of the Sunga dynasty. In other words, less than 50 years after the death of Ashoka, the powerful Maurya empire collapsed. Since the Puranic genealogy is ambiguous, it is challenging to determine how many successors to Ashoka ruled. According to Jain tradition, Ashoka's empire was divided among his surviving sons. His successors included Kunala, Dasharatha, Samprati, Solishuka, Devavarman, Satdanwan, and Brahadatta. It is challenging to pinpoint their precise time frame, though Romila Thapar argues that it is possible for the empire to be divided between two post-Ashokan monarchs based on later Buddhist chronicles. Such an event might have represented the empire's declining strength. Ashoka founded the empire which was destined to fail by the emergence of weak kings after him, according to S.C. Roy Chaudhary and B.N. Mukherjee. While it is true that strong political leaders with charisma could increase a country's power, the rise and fall of a powerful empire cannot be adequately described by focusing on the character of a single or few dynastic rulers or the presence of lesser known individuals. In general, these successors lost administrative, economic and military domains as a result of weakening the empire politically. The partition of the empire proves that the disintegration process started right after Ashoka's death. Now, we'll be talking about other political factors. One of the main factors contributing to the collapse of the Mauryan Empire is believed to have been the chaos that broke out in the administrative system after Ashoka's death. Whether to carry on Ashoka's Dhamma policy and its predominance 
in administration was the urgent concern for his successors. It was difficult to understand how government operated under this totally novel type of rule. Ashoka's success was a result of his singular capacity to understand a society's intricate social issues and his recognition of the value of the Dharma principle in all of its manifestations. It is unknown if Ashoka's successors gave the Dhamma the same priority he did despite his personal exhortation. The existence of a sizable group of state representatives known as Dhamma Mahamatas was another aspect of Dhamma's political significance. According to some historians, they rose great power and operation during the second hop of Ashoka's rule. Ashoka himself commanded them to protect people from injustice and to be kind and compassionate. In the first separate edict to the Mahamatas stationed at Doholi and Jugada, Ashoka had complete control over the government. There is no question about that, but the same cannot be said for the monarchs that followed him. It was important to manage the entire area in addition to being in touch with the Dhamma Mahamatas to make sure they did not misuse their authority. The issue was Mauryan bureaucracy. Due to its structure, the Mauryan state required a powerful king. The fact that the monarch was at the center of the power system that eventually held these bureaucrats together meant that when the king fell, the administration as a whole also did. The provinces started to split out when the center of the government weakened. The king personally selected the members of the state and they were solely obedient to him. There was a constant stream of new officials who were only personal devoted to their respective kings and not to the state when weak rulers came and governed for brief periods of time. Due to this custom of unconditional loyalty, there was a chance that officials would vehemently favor or oppose the new king. This dilemma probably certainly faced the later Mauryan kings on a regular basis. In fact, with these historical ties to support them, local kings and rulers found it simple to establish themselves as significant centers of authority. As a result, the subsequent Moria's regional governments started to doubt the authority of the center. Although the idea of popular uprisings undermining Mauryan state control cannot be accepted, there is strong evidence to suggest that the social foundation of Mauryan bureaucracy was strained and under pressure, leading to an ineffective administration that was unable to uphold social order generally. Under the first three Mauryas, the extraordinary intricate network of spies deployed to gather information on corrupt officials functioned effectively. However, under the later Mauryas, it disintegrated. As a result, the rulers had no ability to monitor the general mood inside the empire or stop the corruption that had definitely taken hold once ineffective leaders were in charge at the top. A major political factor in the Mauryan king's collapse, according to some historians, was their deliberate weakening of military control. We shall discuss it in some more detail in the section that follows because Ashoka made a deliberate choice regarding the matter in a major portion of this. The Magadhan Empire's decline cannot be effectively explained by arguing that there were ineffective successors, inactive armies or popular uprisings. We must state clearly at this point. Each of these actually had a deep-seated connection 
to the unique bureaucratic structure of the Mauryan Empire. And when this started to fall apart, the entire political system was in trouble. Now, we'll be talking about Ashoka and his policy of Dhamma and to what extent it was responsible for the decline of the Mauryan Empire. According to many historians, Ashoka's political choices are the result of those choices wired to blame for the collapse of the Mauryan Empire. Usually, they stress the negative aspects of Ashoka's religious policy. These arguments consist of two branches. First, to start some scholars think that Pushmitra Sunga's assassination of the final Mauryan monarch was a strong Brahminical response to Ashoka's pro-Buddhist and some of his successors' pro-Jain policies. In addition, it was also claimed that the Satvanas, who succeeded the Mauryas as rulers in the Dakkan, were Brahmins. These academics outline a number of actions taken by Ashoka personally that may have enraged the Brahmins. For instance, the prohibition of animal sacrifices is one that was particularly resented because it was implemented by a Shudra king. According to Purana accounts, the Mauryas are listed as Shudras. They contend that Ashoka's appointment of the Dhamma Mahamatas undermined the Brahmins' reputation. These officials forbade Brahmins from maintaining their old penal codes and other Simriti injections. The aforementioned claims are not, however, directly supported by any evidence. These are generalizations that can both be challenged. For instance, it is stated plainly in the Ashokan inscription that the Dhamma Mahamatas were to honor both Brahmins and Shermans equally. However, it is possible that these politicians lost the support of the populace over time. On the basis of tales found in Buddhist literature, this can be inferred. They clearly possessed unique rights and kingly punishments as officials intended for the development of the Dhamma. And as a result, they were feared by all of the people. As soon as they gained authority, Ashoka was unable to interact with the populace directly. However, this does not imply that these officials had a particular hatred against the Brahmins. For this reason, the claim that Pushmitra, a Brahman commander, started a revolution and that Ashoka's policies damaged the interest of the Brahmins cannot be accepted. If this were the case, Ashoka's policies should have resulted in an uprising soon after his death or even during his lifetime. But this event is taking place, say, after a long period of time, so that's why it cannot be accepted. According to another group of scholars, Ashoka's pacifist policies should be highlighted as a contributing factor to the decline of the Mauryan Empire. They believe that this was the cause of the empire's strength being compromised. This justification focuses on Ashoka's Ahimsa or non-violence philosophy. The king's non-violence also meant that he stopped exercising authority over officials, particularly those in provinces who had become repressive and needed to be reined in. This argument continues by citing incidents from Buddhist tales in Devya Vadana to demonstrate that uprisings had been occurring in the provinces. Ashoka is very different from how he is depicted above. As the theory of anti-Brahminical activity during Ashoka's time has been ruled out as a contributing factor to the decline of the Mauryan Empire, the idea of an unduly pacifist Ashoka who lacked vigor and will to dominate must also be disregarded. It is true that Ashoka thought 
the Dhamma required non-violence. On this matter, there was no strong stance taken. The palace's policy of continuing to kill animals for sustenance, although on a smaller scale, was not actually terminated. Additionally, the death penalty should have been abolished in criminal just and governance, but it was not. Additionally, there is no proof that the army was demobilized, nor is there even an indication in the inscriptions that such a policy was planned. The only available proof is from one campaign against Kalinga, which resulted in the latter's horrific destruction. If Ashoka had been a true pacifist, he would have restored Kalinga's status as a sovereign nation. However, because of necessity, he kept Magadha's sway over it. Numerous such instances of Ashoka's asserting his authority over the various inhabitants of his empire exist, particularly his warning to the tribes. He had been adamant that misbehavior of the tribes residing in his kingdom would only be tolerated up to a certain degree and not beyond that. Ashoka took all of these measures to ensure the safety of the empire. As a result, the Ahimsa doctrine had no negative impact on the Mauryan empire's military or government. After all, Pushmitra Sunga was a general in the Mauryan army and is credited with keeping the Greeks out of Madhya Desha more than 500 years after Ashoka. Even a whole generation of pacifism, in Romila Thapur's opinion, cannot weaken an empire and cause it to fall apart. The rise and fall of empire is not solely a result of conflicts and geographical conquests. There are other places to look for the causes. So, we will now be looking for the economic problems and how far they were responsible for the decline of Mauryan Empire. D.D. Kosampe emphasized the economic concerns of the Maurya. These had a profound impact on the demise of the Mauryan Empire. His argument center on two ideas that show the Mauryan economy was constrained by money. Punch-marked coins from this era display signs of currency debasement and the state took disproportionate step to raise taxes on a number of items. His statistical examination of the period's punch-marked coins serve as the foundation for the later claim. Some of the main arguments of the Kosambi's theory, which according to him, were generally responsible or have played a significant role in the Magadhan Empire's significant transformation and final fall. That is, the state's monopoly on metals is said to have been weakening over time. Iron, a key component of the developing agrarian economy, was becoming increasingly in demand and the Magadha was unable to keep up in the Dakan fresh sources of it were really sought out and developed. Even though these areas of iron ore were found in Andhra and Karnataka, the Magadha state found that it was expensive to tap into them. The protection of the mining regions against encouragement by local leaders was one of the numerous problems they encounter in this regard. It is also emphasized that famines may have been caused by increased farming, intensive use of forest wood, and overall deforestation. There is proof that North Bengal experienced a severe famine during the Mauryan era. Therefore, a number of elements may have conspired to significantly lower the quantity of state's revenue. The state was supposed to offer major help during famine years. A centralized administrative structure faced numerous other serious challenges 
as a result of the issue of limited revenues. The Arth Shastra suggested taxing actors, prostitutes and other people to raise money. The treasury's need for additional money or devolution of the currency due to inflation gave rise to tendency to tax anything that might be taxed. The Arthashastra's instructions for emergency action are read in this context. Further, evidences that debasement had gained precedence in order to meet the demands of a depleted treasury comes from the declining silver content of punch marked coins attributed to subsequent Mauryan emperors. The financial load has grown as well. The significant sums of money spent on public work throughout Ashoka's reign demonstrate this. Additionally, his official visits and those of his staff meant that any surplus was used up. Thus, even during Ashoka's reign, the state's strict control over its finance had started to loosen. Romila Thapar has expanded on her earlier remark on these subjects. Not be harmed by the devaluation of coins. In fact, it is challenging to determine exactly when and why coinage debasement took place. Positively, she argue that the general state of the economy as shown by material evidences implies an improvement for many regions of the Indian subcontinent. The use of better material, which is indicative of technological advancement, is why this is most obvious. Coinage may have been devalued, but according to her, this was more likely caused by severe political turbulence, especially in the Ganga Valley, than by a fall in living standards. This must have caused the merchant classes to hoard money and debase the currency. She comes to the conclusion, though, that there is no denying the economic success that followed the political collapse of the Mauryan Empire. Now, lastly, we will talk about the growth of regional polities and how far they contributed in the decline of the Mauryan Empire. In actuality, only the most crucial and significant regions of the empire whose heart was Magadha had been directly ruled by the Mauryas. More likely, locals were used to select the governors and officials in the control of central region. These individuals frequently held high positions of authority and acted as a check on the viceroy or the king's envoy. As was previously said, the political allegiance of these officials was essential to the imperial structure's existence. These allegiances changed when the king did. In effectiveness of the system would be demonstrated if this frequently occurred as it did in the post-Ashokan era. The governing framework put in place by the first three Mauryas had not been fundamentally altered by the half-dozen rulers who had come after Ashoka. Certain of these kings may have exercised concurrent authority over various regions of the empire, according to some theories. This shows that the empire was split even throughout the Mauryan era. Several kingdoms arose in various regions of India following the collapse of the Mauryan empire. After the Mauryas, Pushmitra founded the Sunga dynasty. However, the Sungas were only able to rule over a fraction of the ancient Mauryan kingdom. The Sunga dynasty served as viceroys during the reign of the Mauryas either in the western Malwa province of Ujjain or the eastern Malwa neighboring region of Videsha. The Sungas were succeeded by the Kanvas, who ruled for a short while. However, 
the Greeks eventually were extremely successful throughout the majority of northwestern India. Only the Sakas who had relocated along the Indus had the power to overthrow their dominion. Northwestern India was also affected by the Parthians or Pallavas. However, the Kushana Empire's formation in the first part of the first century AD marked the beginning of most effective foreign incursions. In the Ganga Valley, Rajasthan, Eastern India and the Dakkan, numerous families ascended to power. It is obvious that the Ganges Valley had the most village settlements during the Mauryan era. Assam and Bengal's hills and plains were yet to be discovered. The Magadan Kingdom also interacted with the south and southeast of India, but these territories hadn't yet developed a significant agrarian economy. Numerous regional leaders rose to power when the Mauryan Empire was overthrown in places like Vidarbha, the eastern Dakkan, Karnataka, and western Maharashtra. The Satwana family steadily expanded their Dakkan kingdom by fusing numerous regional centers. The three most powerful chiefdoms in the extreme south following the Mauryan era were the Chiras who controlled Malabar, the Cholas who controlled the southeast coast and the Kaveri Valley, and the Pandyas whose power center was near the tip of the peninsula. A lot of knowledge about the society, ecology, politics, and economy of the areas governed by these three kingdoms may be found in the Sangam literature from this time period. The emergence of these regional powers from different parts of Indian subcontinent was obviously at the cost of the Mauryan Empire, and they emerged on the political scene only after the decline of the Mauryas. So, in nutshell, we can say that Ashoka and his policies are attributed by some early scholars as being the cause of the Mauryan decline. However, we have shown that this is not supported by current data. It has also been taken into account that some historians have attempted to explain the collapse of the Mauryan empire in terms of economic issues. The development of local polities in North and South, which hastened the collapse of the Mauryan Empire, need also to be emphasized while looking for the decline of the India's first great empire. Dear students, it was all about today's lecture regarding decline of Mauryan Empire. Hope you have understood it well. See you next time with a new topic. Till then, take care and goodbye.